I want to give a special shout out to all my patrons, my Biblio Spren, Biblio Howlers, and Biblio Mansers. Thank you so much for supporting my hobby and passion even more. It means so much to me. Hi everyone, Patek here. In today's conversation with authors, it has been a while since I did a conversation with authors, but today I really have to do one because I am inviting uh, Gaurav Mohanty, the author behind Sons of Darkness, to this channel. So, hi Gaurav. As an introduction, can you tell us a bit about yourself first? Hi, Patrick. Uh, so I'm Gaurav Mohanty. I'm the author of Sons of Darkness. Uh, my Tinder profile says that I'm a lawyer who also <laughs> moonlights as a stand-up comic. <laughs> uh, so I'm based in India and I'm so excited to be having this conversation with you on your channel because mm. your review of my book kind of gave Sons of Darkness the you know, jumping platform which it's so required. So thank you so much, Patrick, for having me here. Oh, I'm really glad to hear that <laughs> because I really, I really love this book. And you have mentioned like several times, pr uh, pretty much everyone who have read your book know about this. But A Song of Ice and Fire, like your background, is uh, yeah. is one of your main inspirations behind Sons of Darkness. So what is it about as a fan of A Song of Ice and Fire? What is it about this series that really push you to write? So when I, uh, and I must confess that before I actually read the book, I watched the first season. But yeah. fortunately, I watched the first season of Game of Thrones before it became popular. I mean, the year it just came out. Ah, yeah, yeah. And I enjoyed the whole political intrigue that, you know, plagues this entire season. And that's something that uh, really touched me. And I knew that it is something reminiscent of our own ancient Indian epics in Mahabharata. Mm -hmm. So the moment I finished uh, the first season, I realized that, okay, uh, it will take another year for HBO to come up with another thing. And I took that break to complete the books that, George R. R. Martin had come out with till then. Mm. And I immediately jumped to uh, in my quest to find a similar book set in an in Indian surrounding or an, with an Indian magic system. Mm. And that's where I found the gap that, okay, there is no such book. There is no dark fantasy book. The oh. little books that do exist are all mythological retellings. Oh. Uh, they're not grim, dark or epic fantasy books. So uh, it will sound very filmy and Hollywood or in my case, Bollywood, that uh, this was my fifth year of law school and I was reading a book by Toni Morrison where there's a quote that says, it's a cliche, but it's a quote that says that if you uh, want to read a book that is not written yet, it's your duty to write it, something mm -hmm. like that. And so that really connected with me and I just gave it a shot and I mean, yay. <laughs> Four years <laughs> later, it turned into a paperback. So I'm, I'm really fortunate that the muses took a shine on me. <laughs> and it's not only Song of Ice and Fire. You have also included uh, inspirations from stuff like Malazan, Book of the Fallen, and then of the First Law. Did you know that, I mean, you are going to definitely combine Mahabharata with these amazing fantasy series, Grimdark fantasy series? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, when I read Malazan, after I finished A Song of Ice and Fire, you know, you have these Reddit articles which say that what do you do to fill that empty gaping <laughs> hole while Gian Grimm is writing? And Malazan is always on top of the list. So I definitely gave it a shot. It was very difficult for me to get into because mm. that's the second fantasy book I ever read in my life. And wow. Malazan is a difficult fantasy book. Yeah, yeah it I, is. I will, con <laughs> I will confess that when I was reading the first book, I had to wiki the magic system to understand what is really going on with Tattersail. Ah, uh, that's and uh, uh, but it really cleared it and I loved the prose and it was something which was very interesting mm -hmm. and while I started writing Sons of Darkness one of my major uh, quests was to bring into the the concept of badass warrior women mm -hmm. uh, in the perspective of Vedic India I mean while the Indian mythology uh, river a lot of Indian goddesses who are mm -hmm. warriors mm -hmm. but we don't have warrior characters in the Mahabharata itself so oh. that is something which I really want to reimagine and bring into the pale of the Mahabharata. So, oh. uh, yeah, that's the cinematic liberty I took with this uh, alternate dimension that I created. Well, it is your story after all. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> and that is quite interesting because uh, by doing this, you're not only, let's say, uh, because these are series that I love, right? First Law, Malazan, the Song of Us and Fire are series that I love. But I must also confess that Although I've heard so many times about Mahabharata, I haven't read the book. I haven't read yeah. the story yet, especially because people said that it's quite difficult to get into, right, Mahabharata. And because of reading this, uh, reading about uh, Sat Satyabama, Karna, yeah. oh my God, Karna. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> reading about them really sparked my yeah. interest. So it's kind of like working both ways. Like 
we're reading Western and also South Asian inspired fantasy at the same time. And I think that is quite an impressive thing to do. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Patrick. I mean, I think that's what mediums exist. For example, I got into Greek mythology mm. after watching Brad Pitt's Troy. Oh, yeah. Because, <laughs> and I was like, okay, that was so cool. And then yeah. that took me to Stephen Fry's Mythos series. And I read Circe's uh, um, Song of Achilles. Oh, yeah. which are, again, amazing books and mm. allowed me to really experience Greek mythology. Mm. So that's something which I really enjoy. And to be honest, so Mahabharata is written like fire and blood. You know, ah, it's history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. recounting of events rather than really going into the dialogues ah. or what the characters responded. It's something like that. And it's huge. As you said, it's very challenging. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the, the length of Mahabharata will make Brandon Sanderson's book uh, look like <laughs> Archie Comics. <laughs> so, it is so, so huge. It's, it's huge. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and because every country has their own version of Mahabharata. Indonesia, yeah. in fact, also considers Mahabharata as an ancient religious text. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh, instead of, I mean, you've read the um, read Sons of Darkness. Um, there in India, the main conflict was between the Pandavas and the Kauravas. I mean, yeah. basically, Team Duryodhan and Team Yudhishthir. Mm. But in Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia, mm. the Mahabharata is actually the main battle between Krishna and Jarasan. Ah. Yeah, oh, so it's okay. very yeah, so it's very interesting how different cultures have interpreted Mahabharata differently, and then I I guess that that is what makes it very timeless mm. and allows us to you know re- <clears throat> constantly reimagine over thousands and thousands of years. And it's not only Mahabharata because in Indonesia, one of the other Indian uh, mythology that is often mentioned is Ramayana. Yeah, Ramayana is very yeah. often mentioned in Indonesia. There yeah. is even yeah. uh, an attraction. Yeah, um, in a place named Dufan. Yeah, there, there was an attraction named after Ramayana. So yeah, oh. it is. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that. Totally. Yeah, when I did <laughs> when I did a review right for Sons of Darkness, uh, some of the commenters were from India, Indian viewer. They said that uh, yeah, I pronounce Indian words uh, so correctly, <laughs> and then I said that's because Indonesia and India, most of the pronunciation, the way they pronounce words, are the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's absolutely. Very interesting. That's very interesting. <laughs> I think initially when I was writing the Mahabharata, that was one slight concern that did come in my head that because I am reimagining an ancient epic, I am not going to change the names of the characters. Mm. I'm going to stick to the character name, but they are, <clears throat> let me say, very high Sanskrit, you know, very Sanskrit intensive names. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I was a little worried as to whether they will be easy to pronounce outside India. I mean, you did a great job, <laughs> but I'm really happy that even uh, European mm. readers are having no trouble uh, pronouncing these names or remembering these names. So I guess that kind of shows that as a a reader world we are opening up to more inclusive and diverse fantasy so that's yeah. kind of pretty cool i think uh in that case probably it is similar kind of like all of us embracing a new fantasy world right they have so many original names like randall thor i mean randall yeah. of targaryen these are like original yeah. names and we eventually uh, remember these names and i think that's kind of the same for european readers as well regarding their sanskrit words i think yeah yeah Absolutely. I completely agree. But I don't think anyone can really beat Robert Jordan and uh, George R.R. Martin when it comes to names, <laughs> especially GRRM. I mean, the house names are just so brilliant. Awesome. There are so many amazing world builders in this world. <laughs> amazing. And speaking <laughs> because of... Because that's what I decided... Sorry, go Sorry. ahead. Sorry. So that's what, I, in fact, while I was naming my characters, I decided mm. to let go of the concept of surnames or family names. Ah. I didn't really deep dive into that because I thought that would become too heavy. And anyway, my publishers were after me to reduce the word count. So I think cutting off surname really helped a lot of places. And that so, didn't uh, happen, right? That didn't happen, right? What? Uh, cutting the word count. Uh, did that happen? Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, it did. Because uh, ah. I think I think we've discussed this on a separate note that the fantasy genre is nascent or rather dead in India. Oh. And the whole idea of epic fantasy is not understood by Indian publishers. Mm. So even though when I submitted my manuscript for the first time, there were three, four publishers who liked it. And I was really happy that it really worked on the first try. But they wanted to split, they wanted me to split Sons of Darkness into two books uh, or three books. And oh, that was just really bizarre. And I couldn't have done that. And uh, even with my current publisher, I had to chop off a lot of scenes or shift them to the second book, uh, wow. which is okay. But yeah, at least they allowed me, they gave me 200,000 words. So 
I'm grateful. <laughs> well, to be fair, two hundred thousand yeah. words is still a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think compared to like, I think you might remember, and I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, I had to okay. make a table, uh, and I had to write Robert Jordan's "Eye of the World," three hundred eighty-four thousand words. You know, GRM. <laughs> you know, two hundred eighty-six thousand words. Yeah. And then I put "Sons of Darkness" like rank seven. See, it's not that big a book. <laughs> I had to like make a convincing case. So yeah, I yeah. I did that. And so you were saying, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and uh, in <laughs> Sense of Darkness, probably one of the most clear, uh, let's say, inspirations, and probably this one will be a bit, uh, let's say, jarring. Probably a bit jarring. It was a bit for me as well, and this was for right. uh, Shakuni. Yeah, yeah, Shakuni. Yeah, it was very similar to Glockta in the first place. Right. And what made you decide to use uh, Glockta's voice? Uh, yeah, something similar to Glockta's voice for Shakuni's uh, point of view. Even, uh, even. You can go a bit slight spoiler here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, uh, basically Shakuni is this character which was written by Vedas, or he might be an historical figure. People differ on these accounts. Mm. Who lived like thousands and thousands of years ago? Who was basically a crippled, uh, devious mm. politician? Was working towards the downfall of an empire that had caused him to lose his kingdom. Uh-huh. He used to be an, a prince before. Uh, in the original epic, what happened was that he was caged with his entire family, and Ooh. his uh, tormentors just gave them one plate of food, and it was a it was a joint Indian family of like fifty people or something like that, right? Oh so my god! So all of them decided, yeah. So all of them decided that since Shakuni is the youngest, they will um let him live, and they all slowly starve to death. And Shakuni's father was the last one to die, but before he did that, he made uh, he scratched Shakuni's leg. He slashed it so that Shakuni limps and is always in constant pain. Mm-hmm. And that pain reminds him of his task to bring down the empire that had done this to them. This is one interpretation. There are like a lot of other interpretations, and I hopefully I will come up with a separate one in my uh-huh. book. But uh, so, and that's why Shakuni was is this quintessential figure for us. For mm-hmm. especially Indians who have read Mahabharata, as this guy whose whose teeth are swollen and he always limps on a cane. So I think when I started writing, and I mean Glotka is also such a beautiful character. Yeah. That subconsciously, they fused in my head. Yeah, but yeah. for readers, I can imagine that. Uh, I mean, I, I think I was just talking yesterday uh, to Mihir and Pierre Stewart about ah. the concept of modern mythology. Okay. You know how first law, Game of Thrones, Harry Potter. Are the new mythology for the subsequent generations, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, for them, Glotka is such a memorable character that I'm yeah. sure the moment Shakuni starts limping and starts torturing people, they make that instant connect. Because so did I. But yeah. since they do not have, uh, they do not know about Mahabharata's history. Uh, they do not know that there was a character like this before as well. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It totally makes so, sense uh, because I was the same, right? I told you that yeah, uh, this is yeah. so similar to Glokta. But then yeah. uh, you also said that once you know the background of Shakuni, yeah. then you will understand why this fits. And yeah, after I do, after I did some research, and yeah, it fits. <laughs> it really fits. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, even House of Dragon right now has Laris who limps on a cane uh, and yeah, is really yeah, devious. Yeah. So I think we have crippled devious politicians to stay. So <laughs> they're doing excellent job to stay in readers' memories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree. But so I, that's that. I mean, uh, I think in in a similar way, um, like for example, Name of the Wind is also considered such a memorable fantasy book. It mm. is considered as one of the greats. In that case, that's why a lot of people would have heard and seen on Twitter make the connection between RR Vedi's first binding and Name of the Wind hmm. because they feel that instant connection. Even though it's different, it takes a different tangent. It 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 reminds them of that. So I guess uh, in a way, the re- writers in the future might subconsciously take characters from our modern mythology, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, it might irk some readers, but. Hopefully, this my book will provide a window to Indian mythology, you know, and they will realize, oh wait, maybe there was a predecessor to Shakun uh, Glotka four thousand years before he was born. So, yeah, yeah. Pretty- I was I was the same, you know, because uh, the first binding, in my opinion, is very similar to the name of Duin. In my opinion, it is very similar, yeah. but at the same time, I also love because it is very similar to the name of Duin that yeah. I love. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, it is kind of a tricky thing, but I also understand why it doesn't work for readers when they feel like it's too similar. Yeah, I also mm. understand that. 
yeah and i think you... that isn't that the charm of mythology because uh, the reason why mythology constantly has retellings greek mm. mythology for example mm. is because it provides this recognized form of structure mm. uh, which we know which we appreciate and it has this nostalgia value that we automatically feel that it's like a nice cozy read which is a reminiscent of the old tradition but mm. it collides it with something new you know so we're recycling in that sense old content but with a new masala i suppose ah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a favorite character to write in a sense of darkness uh i mean i love writing krishna and mati uh, it's yeah. just because i feel like i have split my personality into half and put it in like either of them ah uh, okay <laughs> that, that definitely does not bode well i don't think i'm ever going to get married if i say that mati is like me but uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, i think uh, they were just amazing characters to write for me the responses which they had to situations came very very easily mm. and uh, and karna was someone i wish i could be so ah. it was an ideal that i wanted to achieve so that also was something which i had a lot of fun to write Mm. but the character with which the reception with which i was most surprised with was shashupal because for me uh, i mean he's a great character who's uh. who was he was really represented as an evil one in the original mahabharata but he was a side character you know a, uh. a window for me to see the world but the way people have loved this reluctant soldier slash diplomat I've, it was amazing i really did not see that coming mm. so awesome. yeah and one of the most important characters in mahabharata is arjun right arjuna yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i haven't seen much of him yet uh, in compared to the other characters in sons of darkness and i am yeah. so excited because uh, after doing some research on mahabharata wow i'm there are so many things so many events yeah. in mahabharata <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it is so, so cool uh, so it, it is so cool seriously so cool thank you so much yeah. i mean i think everyone's really rooting for another karna versus arjun scene because they both are so obsessed to be the best yeah. i don't know if you have watched beyblade but it's like tyson versus kai <laughs> or goku versus vegeta goku know? versus vegeta yeah yeah goku exactly. versus so vegeta. Uh, indian mythology has karna versus arjun so i'm really looking forward to deep dive into that insane rivalry and have a lot of fun with it Yeah, Karna is tragic, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I cannot spoil things here, but seriously, for those of you who haven't read the book, uh, this is, I think, will become one of your favorite characters, Karna. Yeah. <laughs> And speaking of a grim dark, you mentioned right that there is no grim dark in India. Pretty much, there is no mm. grim dark fantasy right now. I don't know about the past. I don't know whether mm. it's in the mo- it's only apply in the modern. But there is no grim dark fantasy right now. What made you right. decide to revive, uh, or well, make this genre appear in India? Uh, so I never went with I never went into this with the motive that I wanted to be the first grim dark author. Ah, okay. Uh, it was just something that, as a genre, appealed to me a lot, and I found it very easy to write because I love the idea that. everyone thinks that they are a hero in their own quest mm. everyone thinks their journey is the hero's journey mm. and while one side may perceive them as evil uh there's another side which might think of them as a hero i mean you know that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter concept ah uh, yeah yeah so i i really love the whole idea that there is no line drawn in sand it was very easy and for me to write about it mm-hmm. and uh and i wanted it to be realistic because what i've noticed in a lot of mythological retellings that have taken place is there is a very hard line a very dichotomy between good versus evil mm. you know even the original mahabharata to be honest dealt with the concept of dharma which is like the righteousness wins over pure evil sort of mm. concept so uh, i want to change that i want to really blur the lines and i think that's why the book is also called sons of darkness because mm. it takes characters from the mahabharata who were considered to be on the side of evil mm. and in the sense in the light side of darkness and i want to like throw some light on them mm. that makes sense yeah yeah it so totally makes sense yeah and i think that so, makes uh, for interesting story always <laughs> yeah 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 so and i it was definitely a different twist on mahabharata i mean and when i finished writing it i realized the market that it has that because there is no other grim dark author in india which mm. is both uh, like a good tagline for me but kind of unfortunate because it's 2022 and yeah <laughs> as first grim dark fantasy book is coming out right now so mm. it's bizarre but i'm happy that hopefully this will be like one small step for grim dark and one giant step for fantasy genre in india sort of a thing nice <laughs> sorry i'm neil neil armstrong in the answer but... <laughs> <laughs> good 
good one. <laughs> and is it hard though to find a fantasy readers fantasy readers in India? Because from my channel, actually, I have so many Indian viewers. Yeah, Indian viewers, uh, Indian fantasy readers actually appeared on the comment section of my channel quite a lot. Yeah, so that's very interesting because whenever I go to the bookstores, you do have dedicated fantasy shelves. Okay. Uh, you do have Brandon Sanderson, George R. R. Martin, Malazan books. So that was what was curious to me as to how is there such a market for foreign authors who are writing fantasy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But why has no Indian written it? Or why haven't the Indian publishers trusted a fantasy author to come up with some story like that yet? Mm. I do not know the reasons behind it. I mean, mm. one of the reasons definitely is the publishers in India have a fear of word count. That's for sure. <laughs> and it's something... <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, and it's something unless it's uh, non-fiction but otherwise um, they have just not jumped into the genre I think somebody needed to take that first step and okay. if uh, if Sons of Darkness does end up succeeding hopefully it will open the pathway for other fantasy authors to like chime in and like come up with something new mm. so here's hoping yeah. and- here's hoping that 70 years down the line they call me the father of Indian grimdark fantasy nice <laughs> <laughs> And I will be proud to be one of the first reviewers. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, the Grim Dark, the uh, the Grim Dark fascination uh, for Sons of Darkness is what made this book appeal to so many Western readers, Western fantasy readers. And I think that uh, I don't know whether it's true or not, but so far from your experience and analysis, is there more Western fantasy readers than than India for your book? Oh, absolutely. My publisher uh, is so surprised okay. that my book has sold a lot more outside India than inside India. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's, I mean, like half of the credit goes to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, see, I, I'm, I'm a new author, so I have that, uh, um, you know, guilt thing where I go and, you know, slightly check out good read reviews on my uh, book. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, yeah. And 90% of the reviews start with, like, I thank Patrick or, you know, because of <laughs> Patrick's recommendation I've come in. So it's amazing. And I love the fact that they did end up enjoying the book. So, and no, actually that is not the funny part. The funny part is you introduced my book to Indian readers. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Indian, Indian, <laughs> and that is just bizarre. <laughs> oh yeah. That's so, true. I, I put your book in uh, SFF spotlight. Yeah. Section yeah. of my videos. And yeah, I think because of that, but it kind of works both way though, because Indian uh, readers uh, contacted you to, contacted me <laughs> to uh, to do a, re- uh, a review and so yeah, yeah i ended up giving it a try and i really loved it so yeah it's yeah. plus plus situation <laughs> <laughs> i'm really glad so that's yeah. fun but anyway i think that's the uh, you know the flip side of working with a very small indie publisher that mm. you know we have a very small marketing budget we're trying to reach and india has a huge population it's the second most populated country has one of the highest english readers so any kind of uh, spotlight the way you threw on it helps in getting this book discovered because honestly sons of darkness has become whatever like the popularity that it has received so far it's all because of word of mouth Mm. so and i'm really really grateful to all the kind book community you mihir and the book twitter community you know so that's they've been really kind so yeah thanks Uh, guys (laughs) (laughs) and you're welcome i'm just glad that more readers are giving this book a try and quite quite a lot of our quite a lot of people are loving it so i'm really glad i'm really glad (laughs) do you do you have like a list of favorite authors or favorite books unless uh other than the inspiration for your books of course like the first law malazan and the song of ice and fire do you have other uh lists of favorite fantasy books or authors yeah, absolutely. I, I love Scott Lynch's The Lies of Lock mm-hmm, I think mm-hmm. that was brilliant, you know, and um, especially because he focuses on these tiny scenes, which have no real impact on the storyline, but it's just mm. a conversation between friends. And it's I think that it's amazingly done. It's beautiful. Um, then I love Brandon Sanderson's uh, Stormlight Archive. Uh, yeah, only yeah. like three books down. Yeah. But Words of Radiance and Kaladin. Oof. you know since yeah. that line on, <laughs> is dead and the whole oh, thing yeah, that yeah, yeah. Place, I couldn't believe what was happening and you know it's it's amazing what as an author he made me feel so yeah I yeah was... I totally understand that it was like oh my god <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it was it was definitely epic so these two books definitely are def- on top of my list mm. I'm reading N.K. Jemsen right now I'm trying to read like different kinds of fantasies so that I expand my horizons yeah yeah um yeah. 
I also read Anthony Ryan's Blood Song. Mm, mm. Uh, That's a great one. Cool. I love I yeah, love Blood yeah. Song. I love Blood Song. Sequel was okay, but the first yeah, book was yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm, not a fan. I'm not a fan. Yeah. Of the sequel, so. <laughs> I, I feel you there, but the first book was great, and I yeah. no no. I think I, I think he's written another set of books called The Praya and the Mate. Ah yeah yeah, uh, yeah the Praya. Not, yeah, yeah, so I don't know how the, those books are, but. You know, maybe I'll wait for your review. So <laughs> I've read only the Pariah. I haven't read the Martyr yet. But yeah, the, the right. first book was good. Not not as amazing as Blood Song yet, but yeah, it was great. Yeah. Right, right. And because of you, uh, and I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm I suck at remembering the series names or at pronouncing them right. But because of your recommendation, I also started the Riria Revelations. Oh yeah, 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 the, yeah. From yeah, Michael J. I Sullivan. Love, <laughs> correct, correct. And I love the friendship and banter between these two, the, the two main protagonists, and I think it's amazing. So yeah, that's love, something I, to definitely. I love yeah. that series, and it was really odd because I think there is a lot, a lot of things that can be learned from writing wise, not just reading from that series mm-hmm. because it is, uh, it started like something really fun, lighthearted, and not complex, right? But after you get to the end, there are so many things that has been planted since the beginning of the first book and yeah. like Royce and Hadrian I didn't begin liking those characters I didn't even uh, I didn't even understand why so many people love these characters but until yeah. I got to the final two books or the final omnibus well yeah. I end up loving them so much and they become one of my favorite characters of all time one of my favorite bromance really so good it's oh, so good. that's that's amazing yeah I mean I love the I saw the glimpses of romance very mm. like in the initial part of the book itself mm. and you know it constantly brought into my head the friendship between Duryodhana and Karna yeah, uh, yeah. and I was just like I hope that the bromance between these two guys especially <laughs> in the next book you know matches somewhere to this level so yeah and, that and, so, and speaking of Sons of Darkness because uh you are writing this in English right not in India you are writing this yeah. in the well the original language is English <laughs> and right. what are the biggest struggle of you writing this book is it a language is language one one part of them um no I don't think so because um, India as a country has more than hundreds of languages you know every state has its own language which is very separate from other <laughs> state so uh English is in that way a language which kind of runs unites us Ah. Because of colonialism, the British Empire, whatever it is, it's something which connects India, not only within itself, but also to the states outside. In fact, we are one of the highest um, English speaking countries, you know, after like US, Spain, ah. and there's a lot of other countries, but we are definitely in top seven. So, um, so that way we have a big English reading community. So it, that is definitely not the reason. Okay. But I guess... Uh, when it comes to fantasy, there's so much fantasy in our mythology itself, which we still worship. Okay. Like contrary to the Greek pantheon, mm. which is not dust in the air and it's just part of literature. Our mythology is considered as fact and religion by a lot of Indians. Oh. So in that sense, yeah, because those gods are still worshipped right now. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Sense, yeah. So uh, Krishna is in fact like a very venerable god who still worshipped <clears> every year <throat> with big fanfare in India. So in that sense, I guess maybe that's why no one has delved into fantasy because fantasy anyway exists in the religion which they mm. worship on a daily basis. Yeah. Maybe, I'm not sure. There are too many theories in my head about this. But, uh, you know, here's hoping <laughs> that this works out. And I think there's another issue. Uh, the word fantasy itself yeah, has earned yeah. a bad name for some reason, you know. Mm. Uh, they think that it's like, it's it's only Harry Potter kind of fantasy. Yeah, yeah. I you know. don't understand that it's beautiful literature. And I think I saw your video uh, where you had compiled a list of booktubers who were responding to people who do not, when they say they don't like fantasy. And I think that was amazing. I completely believe <laughs> that. Uh, it, is, it is just annoying sometimes when I hear that. I mean, immediately when they hear the word fantasy. And then, so what's your favorite show? Game of Thrones. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> seriously, yeah. seriously. It yeah. just made me so pissed. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite What's your favorite movies? Lord of the Rings. Oh my God. <laughs> like why you know, why even fact, yeah, why even bash fantasy when your favorite things are really I, exactly. fantasy? <laughs> I completely agree. So in fact, one of my uh like agents in the publishing sector did advise me that when I'm advertising the book in India itself, rather than writing epic grim dark fantasy, I say epic grim dark saga. Oh, you know, oh. yeah, and it's just like wow. I mean, I guess it's so deep rooted in the subconscious that 
I don't know, fantasy is something which can either be Harry Potter fantasy or some kind of erotica, you know. <laughs> so, the, so it's just, there's no midway. Uh, yeah, yeah. How is so the progress? Uh, how's the progress with your sequel anyway? Is it going well? It's going great. Uh, mm. I'm trying to read Stephen King's book, which is called Art and Writing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I have that. I, ha- I haven't. I haven't read the book yet, but I heard it's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Definitely, the writing advice comes after thirty five percent of the book is done, and he speaks about <laughs> how you need to write two thousand words per day, and I think that's where the source comes from. Because I, I remember on Twitter when I did join Twitter, a lot mm. of writers used to post updates that I managed to reach my two k target. Oh, and that was something which was very common across all authors, and I never knew. Is there this hidden agreement that authors <laughs> have that it has to be 2K? And then I realized that it came from Stephen King because he made this rule that you ah, need to write 2K every day no matter what. I see, uh, I see, I see. <laughs> I'm definitely struggling to reach that. But I am faster than George R.R. R. Martin for sure. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether that's, that's something... That's not a great something... comparison. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if you're still writing or not right now. But, well, to be fair, he has done something amazing for the fantasy genre. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, quite quite irreplaceable and legendary, really. Yeah, and I think he opened fantasy as a genre to a lot of other readers. Like, he, oh, I mean, without him, Sons of Darkness would not exist. So, I'm really looking forward to stalk him if I ever come to go to US or UK and come yeah. to Comic-Con and be that stalker. And tell him that, thank you. <laughs> and th- so. throw your book at him. <laughs> 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 so you i'm really dreaming low here you know i should have actually answered that i hope i sit on a panel alongside him but no i had to go for i will stalk him and throw my book at him. <laughs> oh my god and you're still very early in your career so so far how how many months has it been since sons of darkness was released uh, the book was released in June, so yeah, July. Four months. Book. Four months. Yeah, so yeah. so far, what are so, some of the biggest moments of your career so far? Like the most memorable one, mostly. Let's say the good things, just the good things. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, there are a lot of good things that did happen because I did not see the book becoming popular outside India. I had no idea how to reach that audience. I have um, my publisher did not have the marketing power to even market, and we didn't even think from that perspective. Hmm. But when I started noticing that the reviews that are coming on Goodreads are readers outside India, that was something which was very interesting. And I'm like, wow, it's really connecting with them. Mm. Uh, so that definitely was a plus point. You know, the initial realization that, okay, what you have written stands the test of fantasy readers outside India. I knew the book will appeal to Indian readers because they haven't read Indian fantasy. Uh. So it's something new for them. And it, it will be, I, I mean, I was slightly more confident that it will appeal a lot more to Indian readers because they have never seen something like this. Mm-hmm. But when it came to readers outside India, I was not sure because, you know, when you have Sanderson and M- Martin already, uh, this book is coming, whether it'll hold up to those standards. And I'm glad that people still enjoyed it. So that was definitely a plus. Um, second was, you know, basically fantasy book critic and no- novel notions giving it a good one. <laughs> I was so nervous. Okay. And you both are teases. You uh-huh. won't tell me immediately whether you enjoy the book or not. Yeah. Okay, like, yeah, the review will come out soon. I'm like, okay, but is the review good? <laughs> Hello, it's a win. But I'm like, okay, I'll act professional, wait slightly for the review to come out. And then, then thankfully, you did give me an answer that no, I really enjoyed the book. And I was yeah. so happy and excited. I remember telling my best friends that I'm so happy Patrick liked the book. I'm so happy Mihir liked the book. So uh, that definitely was a plus. And I think... Um, uh, third was, you know, connecting with other authors, uh, yeah. other fantasy authors who have read my book and they said that, you know, good job done. So it was like, I do not have any author friends in India so far. I mean, who mm. write in this genre. So f- f- finding that peer appreciation was, was kind of nice. Mm. I mean, I felt like, hey, I have an author colleague. So as someone who's, who works in the law, law field, you know, I'm a lawyer. Our life is very black and white. Uh, Interestingly, yeah. grim, dark brought a little bit of color into my life. Ah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> that, is very, that is very well said. That is very well said. <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> you know, uh, because quite a lot of people treat Grimdark as something that makes them depressed, right? The, mm. But for me, I don't know, maybe this is kind of weird, but when a book gets really dark, 
it makes me appreciate life you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it actually makes me kind of you know my life isn't so bad <laughs> compared to these characters yeah. <laughs> yeah. absolutely and i think i think grim dark is mostly if i try to give it a if i were to put it in a painting i would imagine it as a candle whose light is flickering in a storm you know but it's mm. still standing it's still bright so i love that whole idea plus grim dark has become as wide as the medical field you have your bleak grim dark you know uh, then you have your filthy grim dark which i think uh, <laughs> michael fletcher writes it's oh god so yeah yeah so oh my god yeah, yes. <laughs> so yeah that's the book i read because of your recommendation beyond redemption yeah. my god yeah, yeah, so i felt filthy. like i do not want to be trapped in a room alone with this guy so <laughs> So, he's a very sweet chap uh, so that's that then there's slightly epic historical grimdark which is something which i delved into mm-hmm. so i think i think grimdark as a genre itself is becoming huge uh, but a lot of people say that and i'm sorry i'm going on a monologue here. again yeah, lawyer okay. has it that's how we argue <laughs> before judges we just keep talking but uh, i think a lot of people have spoken about the recent popularity of grimdark mm. but that's where i slightly differ because i think it's like the wheel of time mm. because grim dark used to be a genre back in the greek days like any greek legend you take is technically grim dark yeah, dante's yeah. inferno ovid uh you know the brutality that occurs in the way the greek gods punish yeah. uh anyone who tries to cross them it's yeah. very dark yeah <laughs> so uh i guess in that sense the genre is cyclical that you know when something becomes trending you automatically have a counterculture movement So grim dark in that sense is anti tolkien you know uh, uh, people were wanted something apart from moralistic lines of narnia so they just like went for george r r martin and i'm sure then that's why now cozy fantasy books are coming again into picture after the pandemic like Le- legend legends of lattes yeah. yeah yeah so i think it's a nice circle even you i think when you were reviewing my book you told me that you took a one year break from mm. grim dark yeah i did yeah and so i, I think really that's did. that's I think it's amazing that both these genres are able to coexist. Oh, yeah, it's funny that you say that because I actually stopped reading Grim Dark uh, indeed for quite a while. I think it was for almost a year. It was almost a year. It's it's not like I it's not like I was feeling fatigue with the genre or something, but I think it was because I read the last book in the first law, uh, the wisdom of crowds and felt like it was so amazing that I just kind of well in a grim dark hangover if that makes yeah. sense yeah. <laughs> oh, so absolutely completely like yeah so <laughs> i just kind of stopped reading uh, grim dark for quite a while and and then uh this is kind of related to my next question so the cover art to your book it was revealed to uh, fantasy book critic it was right. absolutely gorgeous uh, this one yeah this is super stunning super stunning and it immediately caught my attention I heard that this is Mahabharata and then uh inspired by Song of Ice and Fire first law and the Song of Achilles and well I knew I had to give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh do you have any involvement in the cover art creation because this is done by uh, Mikaela Alcaino right? Yes. So I mean like I thankfully I did have a lot of involvement when it came to the designing of the cover oh, because nice. um Yeah so uh, again my publisher is a small indie publisher they had a very small budget hmm. but i knew that in a world where there are such amazing books being written that whole quote that a book is not judged by its cover no longer holds true yeah yeah it a doesn't good hold. cover <laughs> yeah i mean a good cover is definitely a window into a good book because it looks like okay the publisher or the author believes in the book enough that they have invested in a great artist Yeah. Uh so I did my research I think the books that I came across initially were of S H Chakraborty's uh, the Devabad series Ah the Devabad yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 so I found that very indie and I researched and I found it was Michaela who had just gone freelancing like she just left a publishing company and I think she had just gone freelancing ah. and I reached out to her and she was very gracious enough to accept uh you know taking she took on Sons of Darkness she sent a few of the cover art pictures and i'm glad that it turned out to be just so amazing mm. she just nailed it i think it was beautiful yeah she's doing a lot of terrific work right now and yeah. i'm i'm amazed that you managed to uh, get her as your cover artist uh, yeah i mean i'm glad i did that before she won the uk designer of the year award <laughs> yeah, like yeah she, she just, did i mean her rates would have been like beyond the skies then so i'm glad that i you know got it on the iron was hot so i'm uh, very fortunate that way because i think a lot of the attention that sons of darkness has gotten apart from the reviews that have come in is also because of the cover mm-hmm. um, because it's so striking and it's different it, i'm really hoping that i 
Yeah, thank you. I'm really hoping that uh, this book receives a hardback soon or a customized edition from Broken Binding or Fairy Loot, something like that. I think it will do real justice to the book, especially with the character art that has already been drawn. Ooh, Satya yeah, Bahama, yeah, Martin. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, you did hi- uh, commission Phantom Rin, right, to do yeah. quite plenty, quite plenty of the uh, character yeah. art. And I think they look really great. Phantom Rin did some amazing art on Red Rising Saga as well. Really loved that right. work. Yeah, yeah. I think she just, uh, every time she sent me the draft sketch, I was like, how did you nail it in the first go? It's just, yeah, yeah. I have no inputs to give. And that felt wrong because ah. since I'm commissioning her, I thought I needed to have some inputs, but I had nothing to give because I just sent her the description of the character from the book, like directly copied the paragraph and sent it to her. Oh. And she just, yeah, did a wonderful job. She gave you options. But uh-huh. All of those options were so good that I had a difficult time choosing. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, Mati's expressions are bang on point. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. It just really matches the personality. So I was really happy with what she's done. That is so cool. And one of my next question is actually related to that. So, yeah, yeah. You, but you just answered it basically. So we are waiting for a hardback edition. <laughs> <Seriously>. <laughs> I'm really keeping my fingers crossed. There will be one though. Hopefully the Broken Binding oh. will, well, approach you to do one. Yeah, very soon. <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, yeah. <laughs> I wish I could play some suspense tune because hopefully something is already uh, underway and yeah. hopefully yeah. Broken Binding does something on it. But that being said, uh, it's actually very interesting. I think this will be a good platform to reveal that in India, uh, hardbacks are a rarity. It's only when a book sells millions and millions of copies that the publisher decides to go hardback, which is wow. very different. Yeah, which is very different from the world outside because when you look at the Bell, uh, Poppy War, uh, First Binding, all these books, they come out with the hardbacks first and that's what everyone's buying. Yeah, and yeah. paperbacks are something which are secondary, but that's not the case uh, in the Indian scenario. So uh... that's why, yeah, the whole idea of paper ba- uh, hardbacks is very rare and it just, it's mostly in the case of non-fiction. So I see. Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> so yeah, this is kind of, <laughs> yeah. this is kind of yeah. informational to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. that's, what, uh, that's what we try and do you know educate entertain and enchant yeah yeah <laughs> nice <laughs> there are there are some books in the western market yeah. like uh, kings of the wild by nicholas imps i don't know if you heard of that one but that one oh was, it. it's amazing yeah it, it is a great book and uh, that was released uh in the traditional market only as paperback so the hardback okay. is limited so sometimes situations like that happen as well to some fantasy authors in the West. But yeah, I think uh, in most cases, I think uh, they they appear as hardback first. Right. Yeah. yeah I agree. Uh, interesting anecdote. So when I wrote the Sons of Darkness manuscript for the first time mm-hmm. and I had to send it to the publisher, uh, you know, I just thought like it should have a cover so that, you know, it gives the official feel to it and they feel like reading it. And I just like researched some pictures uh, yeah. and I had downloaded Kings of Wild cover ah. and put it on my book because it looked like the silver wolves you know from a distance like yeah, turn yeah. it black and white yeah. so uh, <laughs> yeah I mean that's just like some behind the scenes footage for you <laughs> <laughs> and Kings of the Wild yeah the cover art looks amazing as well it, yeah. it really it does capture the tone of the book in my opinion yeah. <laughs> absolutely yeah so yeah cover art really matters a lot and uh, we are yeah. near, we are nearing the end of the interview here so I'm just going to ask one more question before the end uh, is there like any goal or dream you hope to achieve through Sons of Darkness and the Rack of Rita? Oh, the name of the series is Rack of Rita, by the way. I haven't mentioned it on this interview. <laughs> so I think on the Rag of Rita, I think, I think Patrick, you and I had a discussion on this as well. That Rago, I really wanted a name of this series, which is very indie and yeah. rooted in Sanskrit words and something which is very unique. So for the readers who are watching this, uh, basically Rag is an Indian classical music term, which has absolutely no counterpart in any other culture. It's, mm. I mean, if you YouTube ra- a rag video, you will see that it's a combination of Indian instruments and throat um, incantations that it's so soothing to hear. Ah, and okay. uh, I think the closest thing which we come to is a hymn, but it doesn't really capture what rag says. And similarly, when it comes to Rita, it's a Sanskrit concept, which talks about cosmic order of mm. everything running around in place. So... In that sense, I was very happy with the series title. Uh, in terms of what I really hope to achieve with Sons of Darkness is that I hope that the series completely gets picked up mm. and you know I'm able to write all the books because uh, 
I had a bucket list that before I turn 30, I will take a break here from my primary career as a lawyer. Oh. And I'm very fortunate that the break year coincided when the with the year that the book got published, oh, which was okay. in the ninth year. Yeah, so it was great. Uh, I don't know what the future holds. I'm trying to finish Dance of Shadows before my sabbatical ends. Hmm. Uh, so I don't know next year what does it hold, but I'm, I hope that I'm able to write the entire series. I hope that it gets picked up and it reaches readers across the world in the original gold foil edition. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so too because this. Looks amazing. Uh, and I'm sorry for those of you who watched my review. I didn't mention this because I didn't know. So uh, apparently the gold foil one, it only is published in India, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the Amazon, uh, the, the one that you get from Amazon doesn't have the gold foil, but it is the same cover. Mm. Still looks pretty nice. Yeah, it still yeah. looks pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> but then luckily those reviewers who did point this out, by the way, they reached out to me. Ah. Uh, and uh, I was able to dispatch a gold foil book from India to them. And it ah. turned out to be the same cost as if they were buying the book on Amazon there, and which was bizarre. What? Really? <laughs> yeah, I was like, huh? you know, on the whole twenty-five to thirty-dollar range, and it was amazing. <laughs> so, so weird. <laughs> that is really weird, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good I guess them. I guess we are at the end of the interview now, and so for the last question, how many books do you plan to be in the series? And per- but just give an estimation probably on when The Dance of Shadows will be released. And you doesn't have to be a pressure about releasing this next year or something, but yeah. we just like to know. <laughs> I mean, I hope the book does uh, get released next year because I intend to wind up the at least the first cut by December hmm. uh, this year. So, and Dance of Shadows is something which, the things which I'm doing are very different from Sons of Darkness because you spoke about convergence convergence events. Yeah, yeah. And um, and I know you like that. So just give one, I think this is the first place where I'm going to reveal this. One of the convergence events is going to be a heist. Oh, nice. <laughs> so that's something which I'm really having a blast with. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's really ambitious. I'm trying, hopefully it'll work out. And I'm trying to get the series picked up by a publisher outside India as well so mm. that they can do justice to it. So if things you know, fall into place, then hopefully next year the book will get published. And awesome. I intend to write five books, mm. but I'm understanding what GRRM felt when he also went with a similar idea and it became <laughs> seven books. Because as I'm writing the second book, the branches that the characters, yeah. you know, grow into are just like, okay, all over the place. Yeah, this Let's always see. happens. This always happens. Yeah. Like when an author said, this will be a one-off standalone. I always say, yeah. I, I don't believe you. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> Sorry, but this has happened so many times. A one-off standalone suddenly become a trilogy. A trilogy suddenly become a five-book series. I mean, The Wheel of Time was originally <laughs> five books. It became 14. <laughs> yeah. Oh, seriously, I did not know that. Yeah, okay. it is. Wow. It is. Yeah. Huh. I don't know that. Yeah, I mean, I intend to write five. Hopefully, I can contain it, but I do- I'm beginning to have some doubts. Yeah, we'll see. So. We'll see what, what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and Mahabharata, the inspiration is huge anyway. You have a lot of things to adapt from, to inspire, to be inspired from. So many, so many yeah, things. Yeah, de- definitely, definitely. Yeah. But since anyway exists, the world which I'm creating is going to run in a parallel dimension. Yeah. And yeah. it's not going to cover the main war that takes place in Mahabharata, mm-hmm. but an ep- just before that, Hmm. So let's hope that this turns out to be interesting. I'm really looking forward to deep dive into the magic system in the next book. Ah, uh, which yeah. I've just given a bit of teaser in the first one. So yeah, I'm yeah. Really looking forward. It would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bertrand. Yeah. Thank so, you so much for having me. It's, it's yeah. a pleasure. Yeah, this is the end of today's conversation with authors. I really want to say thank you so much to Gaurav Mahanti for coming to my channel. As probably a lot of you know already, I already called The Sons of Darkness my favorite debut, favorite fantasy debut of 2022. And I think with only, how many months? Uh, two months left to the end of the year, that will be the case. So if you haven't read Sons of Darkness and if you love Grim Dark Fantasy, please pick up this book. And seriously, thank you so much, Gora, for coming to my channel. Seriously. Thank you so much, Patrick. Bye-bye. Cheers. See you guys.